Listen in for the nuggets. It seems like an aeon ago, another age, that the Taliban routed the US military and its NATO allies, driving them out of town, packing their tents and nothing much more, and fleeing from a country they had occupied for 20 whole years, the longest war since the Hundred Years' War centuries before. They don't want to talk about it anymore. It is astounding that after an expenditure of more than $3 trillion, the expenditure of an ocean of blood, our blood and Afghan blood, after the total destruction of a Stone Age country, and 20 years of so-called nation building, and they don't want to talk about it. If you don't believe me, go looking for the retrospectives. Go looking for the lessons learned, because not 12 months later, we are deeply sunk in another war, this time in the mud of the Ukraine, as opposed to the sand of Afghanistan. Trump had many faults, and I'll come to him in a minute, but he was right when he was campaigning, at least in 2060, that the United States entrapment of itself in the never-ending wars in the sands of the deserts of Arabia and of Afghanistan was an historic mistake. And that is obvious, will be crystal clear to all historians. But it's not crystal clear to today's scribes who write the first draft of that history. They just don't write about it at all. It is astounding that so many, never mind Afghans, of our own young men and women who lost their lives there, who lost their limbs there, who were emotionally and psychologically scarred forever there, that the war almost might never have happened so far as the states that spent the trillions are concerned. Doesn't it worry you that the same politicians cheered on by the same journalists and broadcasters have taken you into another war when the last one turned out, ended so disastrously? Doesn't that worry you at all? Have you obeyed the injunction to forget that it ever happened? I take no schadenfreude from this. I would never want to live under the Taliban, although it does bring some quiet satisfaction that the predictions that one made back then have turned out so dazzlingly accurately true. When Jack Straw in the spring of 2002 told the House of Commons that there was every possibility that our soldiers would be home for Christmas. He really did say that, scholar of the First World War, obviously. I rose in the House of Commons and said, your soldiers will not be back from Afghanistan 10 Christmases hence. It turned out to be 20 Christmases hence. Jack invited the House of Commons to laugh at me and how they laughed. They laughed and laughed, but they're not laughing now. Certainly the families of those who lost their life and limbs there are not laughing. The taxpayers who spent the trillions are not laughing now. And least of all, the Afghan people are not laughing now. I'll go back further. On the eve of the triumph of the fathers of the Taliban, in the 1980s, entering the gates of Kabul, I told Margaret Thatcher, you have opened the gates to the barbarians and a long dark night will now descend upon the people of Afghanistan. I said a lot of true words in parliament over nearly 30 years, but none came as vividly true as that. A long dark night lasting now for more than 40 years, 20 of those years under British and American and other NATO occupation. The people of Afghanistan have bled and those who sent those British 
American, Australian, and other NATO forces bled not just the Afghans, but bled their own people too, and not just their life's blood, but their psychological blood. The cost of the Afghan 20 years cannot properly be calibrated only in money or deaths. It must be calibrated in other ways too. And one of the most obvious is that the politicians and commentators who cheered it on must be utterly discredited and precluded from leading us into any more such confrontations. And yet it's left to the 99 and a half year old Henry Kissinger, the oldest man on the planet, the man with more blood on his hands than any man alive on the planet. It's left to Henry Kissinger to talk sense, who said this week that reckless American foreign policy making has taken us to the edge of war with Russia and China with absolutely no idea why, where it's to lead to, and how we can get out of it. Kissinger was described in the headline atop the article about his recent interview as an American diplomat. That's like calling Cristiano Ronaldo a footballer. Kissinger is the American diplomat. Kissinger designed American foreign policy and now he says that Blinken swaggering around the world threatening and bullying people to increasingly lesser effect even Rwanda is telling the United States to go and get stuffed South Africa go and get stuffed don't lecture Africa on what they should do and with whom they should do it Kissinger says that Blinken's foreign policy and by extension, Biden's foreign policy has led us, and I quote, to the edge of war with Russia and with China. Is 99 and a half year old Henry Kissinger the last sentient being in Washington? Is there nobody else? Even those who work the television circuits, the sofa TV, the journalistic towers of the New York Times and the Washington Post. Is there nobody left with the sanity or maybe it's the courage to speak out against this brigandage, this swaggering around like drunken pirates that the Biden administration is currently on? Is there nobody is what I ask myself. Let me turn to Donald J. Trump. Wearyingly, I continue to have to make this point. Because I'm against Joe Biden doesn't mean I'm with Donald Trump. But I will tell you this, that the raid on Donald Trump's house and the footage I have seen, don't tell my wife, of the FBI agents fingering Melania Trump's underwear on camera in the name of the law is a very significant Rubicon that the Biden administration has passed. But it isn't the final Rubicon and not the biggest. But I know the Rubicon to which they are headed and in which this will be seen as the first shot in something that may destroy the United States of America. The idea that you should trust the FBI as so many lunatic parrots on the so-called left and progressive and democratic side of American politics is so perfectly absurd I can't believe I'm having to deal with it. Equally, the outrage on the right of American politics about the conduct of the FBI contrasts sharply with the fanboy cheering by such people of every historic act of the FBI from J. Edgar Hoover onwards. What they did to Trump is exactly what they did to the American Black Panther movement 
to communists and socialists and labor organizers, all in the name of justice and freedom. The raid, reckless raid, on a former president of the republic based on documents, documents he's had for one and a half years, documents part of which he had already returned, other parts of which he was negotiating with them about, documents which when he took them, he had the power instantly to declassify them and thus make otios all of the verbiage that is spewing out of American talk shows this very day. Dear, that if Trump had dangerous documents in his house, that the FBI would have waited a year and a half to recover them. It's so ridiculous, it's an insult to your intelligence, but so many intelligent people pretend at least to have fallen for it. They're saying that Trump committed treason. Well, all American presidents have committed treason against the interests of their own people. That's true. But Trump committed less treason than the predecessors, some of whom continue to be players, active players, in United States politics today, I refer to Hillary Clinton, who deleted 33 million documents that she had stored on her own personal hard drive entirely illegally. The Hillary Clinton who paid for and conceptualized the entire Russiagate hoax, which cost the American taxpayers hundreds of millions of dollars and two and a half years at least of vital, valuable, governmental time in Washington. Neither of those were ever raided by the FBI. Jeffrey Epstein's clients were never raided by the FBI, but guess what? The judge that signed the warrant for the first ever raid on the home of an American president was Jeffrey Epstein's lawyer. Now, as Trump's son, doesn't mean it's not true because it was Trump's son that pointed it out today. Shouldn't there be a bit more discussion about how Jeffrey Epstein's lawyer became a federal judge? A man involved in the initial prosecution of Jeffrey Epstein, who then resigned from the bench and became Jeffrey Epstein's lawyer the next day. Out of all the tens of thousands of judges in America, the only one they could find to sign a search warrant for Trump's residence was Jeffrey Epstein's lawyer, who only two months before had recused himself from a Trump legal case against Hillary Clinton on the grounds that he could not be impartial in it. But he could sign a search warrant for Mar-a-Lago, and he did, and the feds, 30 armed federal officers unannounced arriving at the house of the former president fingering the lingerie of Melania on camera and taking away boxes of paper. Donald Trump should have just left all these documents in a laptop repair shop in Manhattan. He'd have got away with it scot-free, although the laptop repairman wouldn't have got away with it quite so freely. Because as that laptop repairman told us again this week, the FBI are never done threatening him to keep stum about what he found on Hunter Biden's laptop. But this is not just a story about hypocrisy. If it was, I'd just be amused by it. It's the first shot in the following chain of events. It is absolutely the intention of the Biden administration to one way or another preclude any possibility of Donald Trump coming back as president of the United States. If you can't beat him, jail him. If you can't jail him, then dispense with him some other way. If I was Donald Trump, 
I wouldn't be going anywhere in an open top vehicle because I'm talking about termination with extreme prejudice. They cannot beat Trump. Arguably, they didn't even beat him last time, but they will not beat him next time, not after the disastrous period in office of the Joe Biden, Kamala Harris administration. So they're going to have to jail him, and that means they're going to charge him before November in the hope of making a dent in the Republican surge that runs the risk of not just taking control of the Congress in the United States in November, just weeks from now, but opening up the possibility of the impeachment of Joe Biden and the imprisonment of Hunter Biden and the others involved in the political and financial corruption of Ukraine by the whole of the Obama administration and the whole of the Biden administration now. And if they stop Donald Trump from running, they will make his movement a thousand times more powerful. And Trump supporters have got most of the guns. And the danger of them beginning to use them and of this degenerating into a new civil conflict, maybe even civil war in America, is a clear and present danger. And that makes it a danger to the world. I'm myself of American descent in part. My great-grandmother was the only American in the entire 19th century that emigrated from New York to Dundee in Scotland. She probably got on the wrong boat, but that's what she did. I have no wish to see the great American people suffer, none at all. But I have even less wish to see the world destabilized by a warring, factionalized, armed, dysfunctional, degenerate United States of America with a thermonuclear arsenal of thousands of missiles that can bring about the end of the world forever with the mere touch of a button. So the stakes on this are high. They're high in the Taiwan Straits, where the American fleet is currently steaming just off the shores of China. They're high still in the Ukraine. As Zelensky vows to fire on a nuclear power plant, and the entire Western media has their mouth zipped shut about it. I promised you it was going to be a bumpy ride. Ha! You bet it is. I'll be right back in 60 seconds.